Hello, I'm Ken Bentley, and you're listening to The Sirens of Audio. Oh, yes, quite so. Yes, of course, I do know the medium. G'day audiophiles, you are listening to the Sirens of Audio, the podcast that explores the universe of Doctor Who and the audio medium. His name is... Philip, and his name is... Dwayne. I just thought I'd throw that and see how you reacted, and you did quite well, Philip, you did quite well. There, yeah, thanks, I'm so, kind of awake at the moment. How are you going, Dwayne? Going very well. Now, normally we try to have a look at uh, a random selection uh, at least once a month but I thought this month because of the announcement that Russell T Davies was coming back that we'd have a look at the big finish story that has been produced that was originally written by him in novel form namely Damaged Goods and last week we had Jonathan Morris uh, on the show and he was talking about uh, adapting that particular story so I thought this would be a good opportunity to talk about that give a little review some of our thoughts on this particular production so we'll tell you a little bit about that story but first philip do you know what i see no what do you see Dwayne? it's a rabbit hole here we go all right so philip with this particular rabbit hole, I'm going to relate it to the story that uh, we're talking about. And, and I've got my virtual background here, so it might not come out very well. But that is my physical copy of the special edition Damaged Goods. And it came out with the Gareth Roberts uh, adaptation called The The Well-Mannered War. Uh, both excellent stories. Um, but I got that on the special edition uh, special limited edition box set from Big Finish, and it is number two. So the first one, what was it, what was on the first one? I think it was the Romance of Crime, and what was the other one? I can't. I look up, and I, I'm not looking through my glasses when I look up, so I can't see what the other one is. I do apologise, but anyway, it's number two. So showing you that hard copy, those were the days, Philip, when I could get lots and lots of stuff from Big Finish hard copy at reasonable prices. Now, this is not any fault of big finish, but postage prices went absolutely through the roof a few years ago, which prompted my decision to go download only. And I really enjoyed getting my hard copies. Um, It's been a while for you too, Philip. You're download only now as well. What was that like, that that process of transition from from hard copy to download? does it does it still hurt at all? It, it actually used to say that it, it certainly did hurt. Um, so my, my my original I don't know five or so years I was buying things from the Doctor Who Club of Australia. So they used to bring things out in bulk, and I used to you know different events go and collect and you know buy big with all my big finish. But then I actually worked out actually that it was actually cheaper to actually just go to the website, order my own CDs, and yeah, once a month. Heaps uh, I'd cheaper. Get my, <laughs> heaps cheaper heaps to buy cheaper. direct. I get my, I get, I get this white padded bag with my monthly magazine with with the monthly so with the monthly release with Companion Chronicles because I was subscribed to that as well and my Vortex magazine, and yeah, having that drop in, actually got, I got sent to my work to the school I was teaching at, so yeah, one I got very excited once a month because that would arrive. You'd never be quite sure when it would come, because it wasn't actually consistently posted out on the same particular day. But yeah, getting those hard copies, opening them up, reading it all through before you took off that plastic, which you could never get get into, like the cigarette <laughs> wrappers, That's trying right. to then dig through those plastic, you know, trying to work out, is there an end to this somewhere? Finally, begrudgingly getting out the knife and uh, doing a little cut somewhere so you didn't scratch the, scratch the cover, ripping it open, opening up the CD case. And I, and I used to love the CD covers, so taking them out and the, the notes that was in there and photos... So for a long time after downloads came out, I wasn't interested in the downloads at all. I really was only interested in 
getting the hard copies because you know, having the physical yeah, copies same was here. so good. And I, I've, I've got a cabinet outside in, in our family room, which was specially built for CDs and for my Big Finish collection. So, which is packed full of Big Finish. So it was a big, yeah, it was a hard change to go to download. But that being said, since I've gone to download and you know, I've actually burnt all my C, all my physical CDs onto my computer as well, I haven't touched a CD for years. Yeah, well, uh, yeah. as I you? said, I, I'm touching it now, but I've only just pulled it off the shelf. I haven't actually played it. I possibly have never played it because I, at that stage I was probably listening on downloads, but I still always liked the physical copy. My collection was more of being more about being a completist and yeah i did like the i did love the artwork and particularly with the the doctor who ranges i would get the era specific cover and i'd turn it inside out turn it the right way around so they all had their correct well what i thought was their correct logo on them uh, lots of people would say they are correct um but that's not how big finish produced them they always had the the logo of the day on the on the front cover they still do but yeah I, I would i would enjoy that i'd get my hard copy of vortex magazine so i'd sit on the loo and read my vortex sorry about that kenny um kenny would be disgusted to hear that i'm reading his beautiful words on my loo but um and with vortex i don't get the hard copies anymore obviously because they would come no. through with the with the orders so i'm i'm reading those online as well and um yeah, I just, I just, I still niggles me from time to time as there's still certain things that come out. For instance, the Chris Eccleston boxes and things like that. Uh, the Dalek Universe boxes. I would have loved to have had those collection because I think, I think I might have stopped buying about halfway through Doom Coalition, perhaps, or was it, or was it, uh, no, no, yeah, it would have been halfway through Doom Coalition that I stopped. So I've only got half that, that uh, collection. And uh, yeah, it niggles me a little bit, but uh, that's that's the way the way things are. Does it does it affect other Doctor Who purchases? Do you think twice about postage, or uh, are you more selective uh, in in what you buy because of postage, or is that not really a factor for you with other things outside of the audios? Postage is certainly a big hit. Uh, at the moment, I'm I've been trying to pull together the hardback Target collection. Which I'm not quite sure why. I don't know why I started it. <laughs> I think I, I finished off every paperback, every cover. Um, and I think lockdown last year, just you know, I joined a few Facebook groups and there's a couple of target Facebook groups that I joined. And I was just watching people with these hardbacks and there was just a couple that appeared very cheap. And I thought, oh yeah, and they were from Australia. And so I sort of picked up four or five quite cheaply. You started and, something? And I just started something. It's just, <laughs> yeah. And just, actually, just before I came up, I just purchased Androids of Tara in hardback. Nice. Um, a straight bit from Australia, so it's a bit cheaper. Cause, yeah, it, but that said, I will still get stuff from overseas, but it just it does cost a fortune. And I, I'm actually collecting a few um, character option figures at the moment. And, you know, the post is more expensive than the figures are. I have actually stopped buying books as well, uh, hard copy books. So I buy them on Kindle kindle now and you know what stopped me doing that it was time lord victorious i was keen to read the novels that came out and instead of buying those hardcover books i wanted to read them right then right there i purchased them and read them on the same day that i purchased them so that's that's one benefit of downloads is you can get them straight away there's no waiting for this postage business i haven't moved to books yet books to me are still <laughs> physical I, I still have to hold a book um but yeah, and, and, and they, you can actually get postage free with books. There's still a number of organisations. That's true. Um, that that they still will do free postage, which which makes that worthwhile. Um, it, it's interesting. I was just I was talking with CDs actually with a mate yesterday, believe it or not. And we'll talk about the. Oh, maybe it was you. <laughs> I forget who I was talking about. Um, just talking about the fact that it was you. CDs in the car. That's yeah. Um, well, with you. Uh, yeah, we just we'll talk about the fact that you know originally you had to have a tape deck and you had to. You know, record them on the tape to play them. And of course, the CD players came in cars because, you know, big finish with CDs makes sense. But the most recent car I've bought now, there's no CD players in them anymore because CDs are now out of vogue. And so you just need a Bluetooth and your phone and there you go. So yep. even the technology now of CDs is just old technology. 
Well, my car has a CD player in it, but only because that's a DVD player, because we've got a screen in the back for the kids. For Because on our long trips, if we don't have movies going for the kids, uh, they drive us nuts. So that's a DVD player, but it will play CDs. That's, um, yeah, times, times are changing, aren't they? Times are changing. Oh, I know. <laughs> well, soon we'll have a chip, won't we? We'll just be inserted straight through our neck and just... <laughs> <laughs> we won't need anything else. I mean, pe- people joke, joke about Doctor Who in sort of the cybernetics, whereas our telephones almost have become an extension of us. We don't go anywhere without our phone on us, clipped into us. And I, I, yeah, I can imagine it may not be long before you just start attaching them to us physically somehow, because yeah, it, it's just an extension of who we are and what we do. This rabbit hole is getting way too scary for me. I think it's time to get out. Anyhow. We will have a listen to a trailer for Damaged Goods and we'll be back to chat about it in just a moment. I remember that night like it was yesterday. Christmas Eve 1977. The night the tall man came. Coming soon from Big Finish Productions. Doctor Who. Damaged Goods. Much as I love late 20th century Earth, what are we doing here? Smile. What? Smile, Roz. Smile. Roz and I are trained adjudicators. We have some experience in narcotics investigation. But this is no ordinary investigation. You said you'd make my son better. You said you were doing everything you could. What can you see? Everything. This area is under the control of the British Army. All persons are to be evacuated at once. The war must be fought. The war must be won. Remember when I said things might be worse than I thought? Well, they are very much worse. Something has found its way to Earth, and it's older and more dangerous than I thought possible. Doctor, that creature is attacking the building. It killed him. All those people just like that for no reason. Remember it, Bell. Remember why it makes you cry. See it out loud for the first time in your life, and it will haunt you no more. Big Finish. We love stories. Okay, Philip, Damaged Goods. Were you a novel reader? I can't I can't remember. You weren't much of a novel reader, were you? No. As far as the New Adventures no, I go? Did, I, no, I didn't read the New Adventures. All. I mean, I saw them around the bookshops and things, but it was just nothing. something I didn't really get into. I, didn't, I was a bit of a purist at the time. I didn't believe they were canon. So I just didn't get into them. So I may have changed my mind slightly now, but certainly at the time, I wasn't interested. What about you? I was very excited. I I got Time Worm Genesis and read that, and I recall it wasn't very good. I didn't enjoy it. I didn't enjoy it. And I've, I've I'd picked up various books over the range, over the New Adventures range. I think the one I... There was a couple I, I really did enjoy. Uh, Blood... Heat, because I get I get the big Finnish audio mixed up. That's Blood Tide, isn't it? So Blood Heat was a Silurian one written by Jim Mortimer, who wrote, incidentally, a fantastic big Finnish story, The Natural History of Fear. We must get to, we must review that one at one stage. Um, and what was the other one? Nightshade, Mark Gator. So when when Big Finnish did the novel adaptation of Nightshade, I was very interested in that. But there, there I, I, a few others I picked up, tried to read, couldn't name them off the top of my head, but I, I didn't really, I, I couldn't really get into them. I picked up um, the the Left Handed Hummingbird, the Kate Orman uh, book was, it's, it's one of the one of the best in the range. It always gets lots of plaudits from fans, um, the world over. But I picked that book up at the time, and I couldn't get into reading all the Aztec names. Uh, everything was Aztec. So um, even even the target novelization of the Aztecs, I could never work out how to pronounce the Aztec names. So I found that difficult to, to get through. There were lots of adult concepts as well through, throughout that didn't really seem to fit in Doctor Who. They were, I mean, that's what they were trying to do. But that kind of thing never really appealed to me. I'm a bit old school when it comes to my Doctor Who. I... I like those sort of adult elements to be in other shows outside of Doctor Who, and uh, I thought that was stepping a, a, a little, a step slightly too far. What about you on that regard? 
Well, I think that's a, a large part of why I didn't read them. It was tonally, it was just not quite what I was used to expecting in Doctor Who. Um, I'm trying to think what I'd read. I, I, so I'm, not, I'm not sure that I actually read any of them at the time. I, I was I was probably that was probably the phase was moving. Once the Doctor Who was cancelled, I I sort of went through a period where I sort of fell away a bit from Doctor Who. And so there's a few years there where I really, you know, I wasn't going to conventions, I wasn't doing anything with Doctor Who people, and it just sort of drifted away. And it was it wasn't until what was it about uh, 1995, 96, when I was just in a in a news agency in in Broadway in Sydney, and there was a um, Doctor Who magazine there with Leela on the front cover, and I went oh, and I sort of picked it up and looked through, and a couple of the articles looked good, so I bought the magazine. And that really started getting me back into Doctor Who in a big way. And I sort of, because I'd been getting Doctor Who magazine for years and years, and then I'd stopped for the, that sort of period for you know, about four or five years. I went back, rebought all the back issues for the five years I'd missed, and just really got you know, back into it in a big way. So I think I had so much other stuff to catch up with. The, the novels weren't anything I was particularly interested in. Though I know lots of people just love them and adore them. But from as I talk to people, they seem to be very hit and miss. There's really fantastic ones out there, and there's others that aren't so good. And yeah, so not, it wasn't my scene. Okay. So let's talk about Damaged Goods. So this is one of the new adventures that was written by Russell T. Davies. And rather than me try and uh, give you a synopsis off the top of my head, I'll read the blurb on the back. The year is 1987, and there's a deadly new narcotic on the streets of London. As part of their investigations, the Doctor and his companions Chris and Roz move to the Quadrant, a rundown housing estate. An ancient alien menace has been unleashed, a menace somehow linked to a local gang leader known as the Kappa, a charmed young boy called Gabriel and his mother Winnie. The enigmatic uh, uh, Fry Foundation and Eva Jericho, a woman driven to the brink of madness. As London descends into an apocalyptic nightmare, the Doctor must uncover the truth about the residents of the Quadrant and a desperate bargain made one dark Christmas Eve. So this book was originally published in 1996, about the time you were reading that Doctor Who magazine. One thing that I find with the novel adaptations, I enjoy them all, but they're not a range that I've gone back to uh, too often and I've often come away feeling a little bit overwhelmed with with the adapters trying their best to get as much as possible from the book into these adaptations and I think Damaged Goods was no exception that there, there was so much stuff in there Philip. Yes it's packed full of incidents and people and characters yeah yeah I can understand, actually, it's interesting because the novel adaptations never took off with Big Finish, and I think, you know, it's just they weren't successful enough. I suspect part of the reason why is that they just had to be such large casts. So they would need to make a lot of money back to make them worthwhile. So, I mean, you know, people still constantly are const contacting on the Big Finish podcast and Nick Briggs and saying, why aren't you doing more novels? And he has to keep saying, well, all these people keep commenting how much they love them, but people just didn't buy them. And so I think without good figures, and, and you look at the other you know, cast in this, the cast in all of them, they're gigantic because you know, novels deal with lots of people, lots of characters. And, and even in this version, it's been paired back. There's one less child in the family. There's, you know, there are less people around. But even so, you're looking at a mammoth cast. So is there anything in Damaged Goods that you can compare to Russell's style of the 2005 comeback? Oh, his tropes, yes. I mean, it <laughs> it's was, full it was, of them. It is full of them. And it was astounding listening to it. I mean, I, I do remember the novel coming out because I remember the cover. And I, I, cause I remember being pretty disgusted by the cover and looking at the thing I wouldn't buy it because it was just such an awful cover mm. with um, things coming out and it was just gory and awful. And I don't like horror. And so I, I have very strong memories of the cover. Um, but in, in, yeah, You're tropes. a softie, aren't you, Philip? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Often I am. I, mean, I, I love suspense, and I don't mind being scared. I just don't like gore and horror particularly. Um, so some, some of the Russell T. tropes in this, um, Tyler family. 
So, you know, he, he, it's funny how he loves his, his family names. And of course, you know, it's the Tyler family on a council estate. And so, you know, he loves his council estates. He loves his families. He loves his mothers. Um, I know Russell thinks that mothers are funny. So right. because, he, because he, he doesn't write dads because he doesn't think dads are funny, but he does think mothers are funny. Yeah. And so you've got that. You've got, um, we would actually, this was, Jonathan Morris did this, but the news reports to give all the exposition. So lots of different news characters giving little bits of news reports to tell you the plot. So that wasn't in the book, but Jonathan Morris deliberately took that and put it in the audio play because there was a way of getting lots of story out and it was something that he knew Russell did. So although that's not Russell, that's, that is the um, adapter. That's, of course. Um, the drug was called Smile, which of course appears in Gridlock because that's one of the, the main drugs they're taking. He have some smile. And so it's interesting that they had the same the same drug there being used. Can, can I just say, in, in terms of uh, Winnie Tyler, the actress who played her, Michelle Collins, I don't know if you know Michelle Collins at all. I'm not familiar. She's probably done heaps of stuff that she's I... Done, but, she's, done, she's done Doctor Who. Yeah, well, I, so she, I should know. She, she's, the, she's the captain in 42. Oh, I see. Okay, well... Did you did you get a sense that her voice even sounded like um, Camille Kaduri slightly? Yes, it was. It was sort of that very thing. similar sounding. It's the London accent. So, I think is that she's what it famous, is? She's she's very famous for EastEnders. Okay, so she, she had a big East, East role in EastEnders. So she, it's that London working class London accent. Um, I, th I think you'd call it Cockney. Maybe our UK friends can correct me later. Um, I think it's a, it's not quite a Cockney accent, but it's sort of, it's sort of a London accent. Um, so that's, that's, that's what she's famous for. Of course, that's what Camille's got as well in terms of using it. And Rose is using a, a London accent as well. So, you know, not, not a, no RP there. It's all, you know, very... So maybe maybe to British folks, they she doesn't sound like Rose's mum, but... Uh, to me, with my Australian ears, though, they, they sounded very similar. And yeah, you're probably right. It probably was down to the accent. What did you think of the, the characters from The New Adventures, um, Chris Quedge and Roz Forrester? Uh, the casting of these guys, uh, Travis Oliver and Yasmin Bannerman, what, what was your impression of those guys? Well, well, once again, because I've not read the books, I've got no ownership on those characters. Mm. So, I mean, there were two excellent actors. I mean, Yasmin Bannerman, I think, is a superb actress. Um, once again, from Russell T. Davis' era, she was Jay That's right. the Tree. That's right. Um, so you know, she was cast from there, and you know, she's a magnificent actress. And, of course, would come back to play Dana throughout Black 7. Yeah. Um, and then, so who's playing Chris? Uh, Travis Oliver. So, Travis Oliver. Uh, what, what's he been in? Do, do we know him from something as well? Let me just have a look to see if he's been in any other big finish. They did do they did do an adaptation of Original Sin, so that was the that was the story that introduced them, wasn't it? Original Sin, so they were they were in that one. Cold Fusion as well was another one. Then they've had their own box set, but as far as any other big finish, he hasn't done any other big finish. That's the only character he's played. So, but the name seems familiar to me. Are you looking him up? Yeah, he was a Doctor Who too. He looks like he could have been in a historical. Oh, gridlock. So he's he. Oh, he so, was one of the two, one of the couple who that's did a right. runner. Right, 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 right. Yeah. So the smile episode with the, with a the smile. He was the yeah. He was the the husband of the boyfriend. Not sure what he was in gridlock. So so both have come out of Russell play. So yeah, Yasmin was in season one, in um, End of the World. Um, Travis was out of gridlock. Um, so, so they've cast people from the show, which yeah, you know, and from the Russell era, which you know, once again. But yeah, both both of us superb. But I, said, I, I don't really know the characters. Was was is Chris Credge? Is he is he bisexual in the books? Oh yes, and that's that's one of the things I wanted to say. There was lots of stuff in the book that had to be totally toned down for this, because obviously with Big Finish, everything goes through the BBC, whereas New Adventures. Back in, back in those days, nothing was vetted by the BBC uh, beforehand. There was lots of sex in the new adventures. There was pretty heavy violence. Um, the, the, the big thing out of this, I listened to this and thought, oh, yeah, Russell's named his drug Smile. So he was thinking about Smile way back then. 
but in the book the drug was actually cocaine so it wasn't it, it was renamed for this so that would have been a suggestion from russell as to what to call it uh for the for the renaming of the drug but the bbc would have said no you can't call it cocaine so that makes sense yeah um this the story was originally set in the north of england obviously because that's where russell uh, comes from uh well that's where he lives don't know if he was living there at the time but certainly living there now i know that so uh it's, it was moved to london for the for this adaptation um yeah there's a few scenes so there's there's um some some bisexual kissing in this that it was a yeah, full-on sex in the book and a few other bits and pieces oh there, there was a an arc in the new adventures dealing with an organization called the brotherhood of the imminent flesh so i don't know anything about that people who have read the books would know more about that and on some notes that i read russell t davies didn't even know much about it it was like a mysterious organization but that organization was replaced in the audio adaptation with torchwood oh yeah cool yes i was going to say torch was mentioned as well um okay that's good uh, a couple of things that um russell does charm is a plot device is a very common device he, he likes using children a lot and you know of course the children were were some major features in this show and it was pretty depressing once again i mean i guess the worst use of a child is in torchwood um in season three but yeah, once again, the children here um, was was pretty strong too. Yeah, I had a note that torture was mentioned. So yes, a lot, yeah, lots lots of links with Russell's other work. But then once again, it's hard to know what is Russell and what is Jonathan Norris adapting Russell in terms of what did he put in. And you know, smile is one of the changes obviously made. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, which wasn't wasn't original Russell, but was changed to Russell. So yeah, yeah. Um, also, a very deep plot point was another time lord weapon and when i was looking into this i thought oh maybe the references to the time war were additions because this was produced after the time war was revealed in the new series but no this was actually something that was in the book talking about a future war i don't think it was probably explicitly the the time war but it was talking about a future war implying that the time lords were in into something pretty heavy yeah, see, but that's very Seventh Doctor because uh, there's actually lots of Seventh Doctor tropes. You know, uh, yeah, an, yeah. An, an ancient evil before the turning of time, a future war, the destruction of Earth. Uh, well, a lot of the Seventh Doctor, even on the TV series, was was talking about the ancient Time Lord past. Yeah, yeah. Well, this was making references to a potentially destructive Time Lord future. Yeah. Uh, which obviously he kept kept going with when he brought it back. So uh, that was that was very interesting too. Uh, it was a interesting all these all these time lord weapons that have come out there there's been quite a lot of them now started yeah. off with um what did we have hand of omega we had uh what was what was the one from silver nemesis called oh the, the living metal i can't think what it's called well it was called nemesis wasn't it but it was it was valedium Something that was like the that. name of the metal wasn't it uh, i'm just speaking purely from memory here i haven't looked that up so please forgive me if i've got it wrong um silver nemesis is not a story i've seen for quite some time so yeah interesting interesting there but i think as far as it being a russell t story goes the the element that stood out the most for me that was and and the and the part of it that was so obviously russell t was the dialogue and the conversations between people how they ran and he's he's got a certain style that is definitely comes out from this novel and this adaptation too which jonathan morris wouldn't have changed too much mm. as far as dialogue goes i will um you know i love the, my musicals and one of my favorite musicals is a musical called blood brothers which is by willie russell who's mainly known for writing drama um you know he, he doesn't usually write musicals but as a bet he uh he bet some friends that he could write a musical and he was going to do write all the music and words as well as all the script and he came up with a musical called blood brothers which i first saw in the west end um, and i've probably seen five or six different productions of it over the last 30 years i guess which is depressing um but i saw barbara dixon play the main role and i've seen i oh, forget the one for the eurythmics in australia 
and um, Russell Crowe I saw playing Annie one Lennox. Of the, uh, no, okay, I got that wrong then. Anyhow, I think it was. But I saw Russell Crowe in an Australian version. So one of the first stage productions he ever did, he was a musical, um, and he was in Blood Brothers. Blood Brothers is a story about set on a council estate, poor London woman, twin sons. She can't afford to keep them both. She sells one to a rich woman. Um, and it's a story that, that then that follows on from there in terms of they, they meet up when they're about six or seven. And they work out they're born on the same day. And so they start to become blood brothers and they keep this friendship going throughout their lives. But unfortunately, one heads down a path of drugs and crime and the other one heads into Korea, but they both fall in love with the same woman. Um, and the day they die, the day, they, the day they're born, the day they die is the same because they actually die together as well through a whole incident that happens. It's just a dreadful, dreadful ending of a play. I sit, sit there and cry the whole last song. It's amazing how much of that story is in this book. So Russell does admit it was one of the stepping stones. But as I listened to it before, I listened to the extras. And I'm just listening to the play. And I had listened to it before. And it probably struck me last time. But as I was taking notes, uh, the, the amount of story in this, in terms of the two mothers, the, you know, the poor mother, but lovely and kind, which is the Michelle Collins character, the other mother being evil and ruthless, which is exactly the same as the musical. It was astounding how similar the different characters are um, all the way through. Mm. But yeah. can, what do you think of the cast? I mean, we've, we've talked about the companions and their job. What about the rest of the cast? I think they were all great. Mm. All fantastic. The, the guy that played the Kappa was really good. He had to do a lot of breathy acting all the way through, but I think he carried it off well. And I, it it was it was quite scary. So we should do a shout out to to Howard Carter as yep. uh, as the sound designer and musician for this one. He does a beautiful little um, sort of theme for the show that starts that that kind of starts right in the opening scenes and runs all the way through and finishes off with that theme as well. It's actually a beautiful piece of music. I was thinking of you, Philip, because I thought. You you would appreciate that too. Well, well I've, got, I've got a note here about the music. I'd made a note. Yeah, the music throughout was just astounding. Yeah, and um, it, what, what what can we say about Howard Carter that we haven't already said? He's just a genius. He really is. The, he's yeah. His themes are just stunning. Um, oh, actually, another one I just thought of in terms of another Russell T. Davis trope was strong evil woman. Uh, so Denise Black plays Eva Jericho. And it's fascinating you see this woman who you sympathise with and care about at the start, and by the end of the play, you hate her. Like, she has nothing redeeming going for herself. Mm. And she's just so ruthless with a smile. And Russell really likes drawing female characters, female villains like that, who you really feel fond of, you feel like you like, but in the end, they're just so evil. Mm. And they're brilliantly, brilliantly played to the black. Very good. Let's leave it there. We won't we won't say much more about it. Uh, as I said at the outset, I believe there is a special on for all the novel adaptations at the moment. So head over to the Big Finish website if you want to grab a copy of that. If the sale has finished and I've got my dates wrong, I do apologise. But it's always good to keep up with what's going on with Big Finish. Subscribe to their newsletter because they're, they're doing sales all the time. And I suspect that they brought this sale out after the announcement of Russell T Davies, just like we thought we're inspired to do a podcast about his story as well. So, uh, yeah, if something's happening in the world of Doctor Who, you, the Big Finish will think of something along similar lines and do a and do a sale on something accordingly. So it's always good to keep up to date with them. Indeed. All right. That'll do us, except for some recommendations. And just checking my notes... Your first, Philip. It's me, is it? Okay. Well, it is this time, believe it go. or not. No, okay. Um, I'm going to recommend a podcast, and I'm a bit embarrassed to have not listened to this earlier. Um, we uh, chatted with Kenny Smith recently, and I ha ha had never particularly listened to his podcast. Sorry, Kenny, if you're listening to this. And outrageous. It, it's outrageous. And, of course, he mentioned them up again, and I sort of thought, I really should have a listen and track them down. And so I've you, been listening You don't to usually listen to those English podcasts anyway, do you, Philip? Well, he's not English, he's Scottish, so don't you dare say that. <laughs> it's not me that says it. 
<laughs> um, I'd be working really hard to use UK or Scottish or English correctly. British, British. Or British. Well, it, dep- <laughs> it depends. But anyhow, Kenny is Scottish and proudly Scottish. Um, as my mother was, my mother used to parade around the house talking about the fact they'll always be in England as long as Scotland stands. Um, but anyhow, that, that, sorry people if you listen to that. Anyhow, Pieces of Eighth I want to recommend by Kenny Smith. It's a podcast about the Eighth Doctor. And so celebrating his 20th anniversary with Big Finish this year, we uh, did a special early in the year, uh, which Kenny came on. <laughs> he was inspired and started his own podcast on the Eighth Doctor after that. Good stuff. And um, it's it's really wonderful. And I've been listening to that and really enjoying it. So, yes, I highly recommend Kenny Smith's Pieces of Eighth. Absolutely. We'll put links to that in the show notes. Great. What about you, Dwayne? What do you want to recommend? I am going to recommend a couple of CDs because it's been a couple of months since we've done randomoids and we get, we're actually last time we picked out a couple of audience selections that our listeners and viewers wanted us to review. So I'm going to recommend that if you can, if you can grab yourself a copy of Sapphire and Steel's Remember Me by John Dorney and Daisy Chain by Joseph Lidster. Because we are going to be reviewing those next month. So if you can get them in that space of time, go for it. Or if you already have them, have another listen to them and we will review them and let you know what we think of that amazing series and tragically no longer licensed to Big Finish series. Hope you'll come back. I I certainly hope so. There's a pretty, pretty amazing amazing stories in 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 that range so yeah that's my recommendation or any sapphire and steel uh other than that uh that's it for today philip short and sweet well done okay well goodbye everyone great having you with us (laughs) thanks guys catch ya this has been the sirens of audio episode 79 damage goods russell t davies on audio with your hosts philip edney and Dwayne bunny Theme music by the Jackpot Golden Boys. Email address is sirensofaudio at gmail.com. Be sure to subscribe to us on YouTube and your favourite podcast app. Find links to all our socials and other info at sirensofaudio.com. And while you wait for your next international parcel to arrive, eventually, download some instant quality audio drama. Because audio drama 